Good morning. I'm Raleigh Flynn, the president of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, and welcome to our program this morning on the latest developments in the Ethiopia crisis. Um, this morning, we have um, with us Ambassador um, David Shin, and I can think of no one better to talk about what is going on in Africa than Ambassador Shin. Uh, we also have our moderator this morning, who is FPRI's uh, program chair for the Africa program, um, Ambassador Charles Ray, who is also a trustee of FPRI. Um, ambassador Ray served as the U.S. Ambassador to the Kingdom of Cambodia and the Republic of Zimbabwe. He was also uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for POW Missing Personal, Personnel Affairs uh, from 2006 to 2009. And before he joined the State Department, he had a 20-year career in the U.S. Army. So, um, Ambassador Ray is an extremely knowledgeable individual on a variety of topics, and we're very lucky to have him with us here today. Um, I just want to mention we also have some upcoming events. Uh, on Tuesday, October 5th, from 3 to 4.30, we will have the third in our, um, in our series of uh, looking at the Meta West as a geoeconomic system. Um, so this is part of our Robert Strauss Who Pay project, which is looking at the Atlantic system in a world of great power rivalry. So um, I encourage you to tune in for that. Um, I would also, before we get started, like to thank our, um, our supporters and our members and for their generous support of FPRI. We can't do it without you. If you're not in one of those categories, member or supporter, I encourage you to do so. Um, and uh, without further ado, oh, one more thing. The Q&A, uh, please uh, put your Q&As, your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we welcome your questions. Uh, we always get excellent questions from our audience and it enlivens the program, it enlivens and enriches the program to have your questions. So please put them in there. You can start putting them in there right away. Um, so without further ado, let me turn it over to Ambassador Ray. Thank you, President Flynn, and uh, welcome to all of you, and a special welcome to Ambassador David Chin, former ambassador to Ethiopia, uh, who will, who's with us today to, to talk about where the situation is at the moment uh, as regards the uh, violence in the Tigray region. And uh, you, you have Ambassador Shin's bio on the program announcement, so I'm not going to use up time to go over that. He's been with us a few times before. I'll turn it over to, to you, Ambassador Shin. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Charlie. I'm pleased to join you again. I'd like to make just a couple of caveats before I begin. Even though I spent 37 years in the U.S. government and the State Department, uh, I obviously uh, don't speak for the U.S. government. Anything I say today is is basically my own personal view of the situation. Uh, the other caveat is there's a lot of misinformation out there concerning the situation in Tigray, in Ethiopia, and in Ethiopia more generally. And I'm probably as subject to uh, seeing that information and maybe even occasionally passing it on as everyone else. If you're not actually on the ground uh, in Tigray and personally observing everything that's happening, it's really difficult to know what is fact and what is fiction. Uh, so I, I not only uh, warn everyone that I may make an occasional mistake in interpreting what is happening, but a lot of other people are too. And, and one needs to be really careful with what is being said about the situation um, in the country. Uh, having said that, um, let me just back up a, a little uh, distance and pick this story up in November of last year when the uh, proximate cause for the conflict in Tigray began. And that was the attack on the Northern Command headquarters in Mekele, the capital of Tigray region, uh, by the uh, Tigrayan Defense Forces. Now, there were things leading up to that that the Tigrayans will argue precipitated their attack on the headquarters. But that effectively touched off the, uh, the current conflict in the country. And it deteriorated very quickly from that point forward. 
Uh, I think the, um, the Tigrayan forces uh, probably miscalculated uh, the degree of uh, opposition that they would get very quickly from central government forces who pretty uh, thoroughly overran almost all of, um, of uh, Tigray region, except for some of the mount more mountainous and isolated parts of, of the region. But otherwise, they, uh, they took control of uh, essentially all of the major towns in Tigray and did it rather quickly. There were all kinds of allegations. Uh, of atrocities that were going on uh, in Tigray. I think many of them have been subsequently proven to have been the case uh, that uh, gave rise to a, a lot of animosity uh, between the, the two sides, that is the people in Tigray on the one hand and the central government on the other. The problem was exacerbated uh, because the uh, central government invited Eritrean forces to join them in Tigray. So you had uh, sort of a pincer movement taking place with Eritrean forces uh, coming across the border into Tigray on the one hand in support of central government forces who, who came down uh, from another direction. And it looked, uh, it looked pretty grim for the Tigrayan forces in the early months of this conflict. Uh, there were reports, and I think that they have proven to be accurate, of drones having been used, probably uh, provided by the United Arab Emirates, against the heavier equipment that the Tigrayans had seized after their attack on the Northern Command. And that was the primary reason for attacking uh, the Northern Command, was to take uh, uh, possession of all of that heavy equipment that they did not otherwise have possession of. But the drones seem to have wiped out uh, the bigger pieces of equipment pretty quickly, which forced the Tigrayan forces to go into a guerrilla warfare mode, which they did for a period of months. And I would have thought, quite frankly, that it would have remained a guerrilla warfare effort. Uh, for a long time to come. Uh, much to my surprise, that didn't happen. The, the Tigrayan forces ended up uh, strengthening themselves to the point that they actually attacked the uh, central government forces in uh, central and southern Tigray, effectively forcing them out of that part of Tigray. The central government forces and Amhara militia and conceivably some Eritrean forces still control most of Western, what is called Western Tigray, which is actually a disputed area to some extent. There are Amhara who claim parts, uh, significant parts of Western Tigray. It's an area that probably will have to be uh, dealt with in, in the uh, arbitration or in the negotiation phase of uh, bringing this conflict to an end. Uh, but by and large, uh, the Tigrayan forces have not retaken control of Western Tigray, which is militarily also a more difficult place to, uh, uh, to carry out your operations. It's more open territory. Uh, you're, uh, you're subject to uh, easy, easier annihilation by large equipment or aircraft uh, when you go into that area as opposed to Central and uh, Southern Tigray. The humanitarian side of this has been a, a major part of the, um, of the concern and still is. Uh, there are various accounts as to what percent of the uh, population is, is subject to uh, famine or is uh, what one would call malnourished. The, the most recent figure I saw was early today where a senior UN official says that the malnutrition rate in Tigray is 22% is of the population, total population of about 6 million in Tigray. Uh, also, the same official uh, points out that only about 10% of the relief uh, vehicles coming from other parts of Ethiopia are reaching Tigray. The other vehicles are held up for a variety of reasons uh, administrative or whatever, uh, so that they're not permitted to enter Tigray. 
and the, the UN official, in this case, the head of the humanitarian side of the UN, uh, lays the blame for this on the central government. So the humanitarian side of the problem is still very much of a serious problem. There are efforts, uh, particularly that led by the United States to um, cause or create a ceasefire, have a ceasefire, begin negotiations. The United States uh, about two weeks ago laid the groundwork for legal sanctions against individuals in Ethiopia if, prog if serious progress is not made uh, it will start negotiations and ideally uh, result in a ceasefire. But the whole thing has been further complicated because Tigrayan forces have also entered uh, part of the Amhara region, a small part of Afar region, uh, in effect expanding the conflict into areas outside of, uh, of Tigray. Uh, at the moment, I don't see any particular progress being made on either a ceasefire uh, or the beginning of negotiations in the country. Uh, the U.S. Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa, Jeffrey Feltland, is at this moment in Sudan dealing with a separate issue in Sudan. I don't know whether he plans to make another visit to Ethiopia on this current trip to Sudan or not. Uh, in any event, he's very much engaged in trying to bring the parties together uh, in, um, uh, in Ethiopia in order to begin the negotiation process. The idea is to have the African Union lead this process. So far, they've had uh, very little success in doing so. Uh, the UN is very supportive of uh, going forward with negotiations and a ceasefire as are the Europeans. Uh, on the other hand, you have countries like China and Russia that are sort of taking a hands-off approach. They don't like the idea of American sanctions and are saying don't, uh, US should not engage in the internal affairs of Ethiopia. So basically not playing a very, uh, a very positive role in the dispute. And that's essentially where we are at the moment. It's, um, uh, not a good situation. The humanitarian uh, situation particularly is, uh, is bad, uh, arguably uh, getting a little worse, and there isn't much progress on the political side. So let me stop there and uh, be happy to open this up as you wish. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, David. And before we open up to the audience, I'd like to ask a couple of questions uh, just to get your take on it. Uh, recently, I read in a news report that uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, made some rather uh, provocative statements where he called upon the people of Ethiopia to join in, in the destruction of the TPLF. Uh, first of all, do you think that's credible? And secondly, what do you feel the impact of his, that public statement will be on the chances for any kind of negotiations? Well, the, the government of Ethiopia, the parliament, uh, declared, um, I guess about a year ago, that the TPLF is, quote, a terrorist, unquote, organization. And they have treated the TPLF ever since as a terrorist organization. Uh, that really hardens the line. I mean, it makes it very difficult to even consider negotiations with a, uh, a group that you consider to be a terrorist organization. Now, mind you, this is the same TPLF that from 1991 to 2018 was the leading partner in the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, which was the government of Ethiopia. So it was the leading partner in the government of Ethiopia that the entire international community accepted. Uh, and for that matter, uh, Abiy Ahmed was part of that government at the time. Now, the terrorist declaration is, is obviously much more recent and based on different grounds, but it, it does create uh, clearly a problem when it comes to uh, negotiating a solution to this. So I, I think that the, the statement that you um, ran across is, uh, is credible. And I think that the government of uh, Ethiopia probably does desire to in effect crush the TPLF, uh, as does the government of, of Eritrea. The Eritreans have made uh, no secret of the fact that they would like to eliminate 
the TPLF. Uh, I have no idea what the real support is in Tigray today for the TPLF. It would seem to be strong based on the fact that the Tigrayan Defense Forces uh, had so much success militarily. And you're not going to have that success unless you have a fair amount of support from the local people. But you know, there hasn't uh, been a, uh, a, a referendum or an election in the last several months in, in Tigray, so we don't really know for a fact sort of where everyone is on the issue. Uh, but it, uh, it, it's a difficult situation at the moment. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, bef just before the program started that, that the TPLF has actually moved forces out of the Tigray region into other regions of Ethiopia. Would you care to expand on that a bit and how that impacts the chances of a settlement of this issue? Well, they have. They've moved uh, the, the Tigrayan Defense Forces, and I, I use that term decidedly. Uh, in that it's not entirely clear to me if the Eritrean, uh, if the uh, Tigrayan Defense Forces are, are totally controlled by the TPLF or whether there is some independence there. And I, I simply don't know the answer to that question. It seems that they are at a minimum, they're very closely linked to the TPLF at this point. And they may be under the total control of the, of the TPLF. But earlier on, there were indications that the, um, the Tigrayan Defense Forces were, were operating with an element of independence. In any event, uh, this is the force that moved uh, first into a, a contiguous part of Afar region, I think for logistical reasons to control a key road, a key entry point into Tigray. And that probably explains the, uh, the, the rationale behind going into a relatively small part of Afar region. But then they moved into Lalibela, which is one of the uh, most important um, cultural and religious uh, areas in the Amhara region. And quite frankly, that was a little harder to explain. I, I don't know what their rationale was in going to Lalibela, uh, but that certainly has complicated the, uh, the, the geography of this conflict. And, and made it more difficult to sort of separate out um, who, um, who's responsible for, for what. Um, it seems to me like the um, Tigrayan forces, from a, from a propaganda point of view, from a public relations point of view, would have been wiser to stay in Tigray region rather than branch out, particularly into Amhara region, but also into Afar region. Mm. I, I asked this question uh, last year in our November program uh, on the role that the Africa Union is playing or not playing in, in this conflict. But I, I, I wonder, uh, has there been any change in the, the position taken by the Africa Union and actions taken by the Africa Union to try and help settle this dispute? You know, it's very difficult to say, Charlie, because we, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes and, and whatever the African Union is doing in this regard, it presumably is doing quietly. Uh, certainly, if you look at it from the standpoint of, of public engagement, I don't see very much. And that is worrisome uh, in that one would theoretically see a little bit more perhaps going on. But I, I may be uh, excessively critical here in that uh, I don't know what they are doing quietly vis-a-vis -vis the government of Ethiopia and vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the TPLF. Uh, it may be more substantive than I'm aware of, but it, it, it's sort of a delicate situation for the African Union because it has its headquarters in Addis Ababa. And, uh, I, I think immediately that raises suspicions, at least in the minds of the TPLF, as to whether they will be a, an unbiased uh, interlocutor on all of this. But the fact remains that they are best placed to, to negotiate, to help negotiate a solution to the problem. But they have got to step up to the plate here and, um, and engage uh, in a major way. I had one final question before we turn it over to audience questions. Um, 
now that we finally have here in the U.S. a confirmed Assistant Secretary for African Affairs, uh, do, do you foresee a more active uh, role on the part of the State Department, the U.S. government, in trying to help mediate an end to this violence or, or not? Well, I think there will be uh, greater involvement. You have one more senior person who's going to be very much involved in in the process, uh, but you have had Jeffrey Feltman, a special envoy for the Horn of Africa, whose primary uh, engagement so far has been the, the issue in Ethiopia. So it's not as though there has been any particular lack of engagement by the Biden administration. Um, Secretary Blinken has been directly involved on any number of occasions in, in what is going on in Ethiopia, and even the president has on a few occasions uh, stepped in. Uh, the executive order that came out on uh, laying the, the legal groundwork for sanctions was under his name. Uh, he issued a statement at the same time on the situation in Ethiopia. Uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised but what uh, the president has made a couple of phone calls that we don't necessarily know about uh, so the administration has been very engaged, but I do see uh, additional attention uh, to the issue with the, uh, the Senate uh, confirmation of a new Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. Uh, thank you. And uh, now uh, we will turn it over to questions from the audience. Uh, President Flynn, uh, you have the mic. Uh, thank you. We have some very good questions and we encourage you to put some more in. Uh, the first question I'll go to is from Ambassador Herman Cohen. Uh, he asks, is it accurate to say that failing to defeat the TPLF in combat, the government is resorting to starving the Tigrayan population? Um, starving may be a little bit of a strong term, but as I indicated earlier, if if the UN is reporting that um, the number of relief trucks reaching Tigray today is uh, only about 10% of what is needed in order to provide a combination of food, fuel, and medical supplies to Tigray. And the, the government is clearly the responsible party for not allowing more trucks in then we obviously have a serious problem here. Uh, is that starvation? I don't know. Uh, it's very worrisome, let me put it that way. Now, there is another side to this problem, which is very curious. Um, there was a report about a week ago indicating that in, in the last two months, leading up until about the middle of September, some 487 trucks, uh, 480 some in any event, had reached Tigray. In other words, had been permitted to go from somewhere in Ethiopia with relief supplies that actually entered Tigray. But of that 480 some, only 80 some returned to the rest of Ethiopia. In other words, the other 400 or so are still sitting somewhere in Tigray. Uh, then the question arises, well, why is that? Why don't they go back and bring more food down? Now, there are various possible explanations for it. Uh, the central government will argue, well, the, the TPLF is holding the trucks all hostage. Now, I suppose that is a possible explanation. But the more logical explanation seems to be there isn't enough fuel to get them back. So they, they get down to Tigray and you know, run out of fuel and you sit there. Um, the, other, the other explanation is that most of the drivers are Tigrayans because they can obviously negotiate the um, Tigrayan side of the border. And they get down there and say, I'm not gonna go back. Uh, I'm just gonna stay in Tigray. Uh, so those strike me as being the two more logical explanations for why all of these trucks are now stranded in Tigray, but it, it does obviously exacerbate the problem of uh, providing relief supplies uh, to the Tigrayans. So there are multiple issues that, that are occurring here and only some of it can 
probably be laid at the feet of the central government of Ethiopia. Uh, we have another question, a uh, uh, comment and question. It's been reported that the Ethiopian government is expelling some of the most senior UN representatives in the country. What does Ambassador Shin think is going on? Now, I must confess, I have not seen that report, and I don't know who these folks are. Um, and without knowing that, it would really be hard for me to um, make any kind of judgment as to what it means. Now, it depends not only who they are, but how many we're talking about. Uh, there's, because, also, there's also a clarification um, that reportedly it includes the country representatives for UNICEF and I don't know how to say this, UNOCHA, U-N-O-C-H-A. Okay. Well, those are both uh, relatively senior people and, and they're important people. Uh, they're, they're both organizations that uh, have been very engaged in, uh, in Tigray. And I wouldn't be too surprised if you go back and look at public statements from both organizations, I've been fairly critical of the government of Ethiopia, which may explain the expulsion. Um, if, if we're only talking about two, however, uh, I wouldn't, um, that's of concern, obviously, but there are a lot more than two UN officials in Ethiopia today. So it's, um, it's not the end of the world, but it, it is disturbing. Um, going to some of the um, economic issues, uh, we have a question about whether the, the conflict has affected Ethiopia's negotiations with Egypt and Sudan on the terms associated with the, the GERD project. That's the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. I think indirectly, this certainly what has happened in Tigray has an impact upon the discussions concerning the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, uh, particularly as concerns uh, Sudan more than, uh, than Egypt. Uh, Egypt does not have a contiguous border with Ethiopia, Sudan does. And you in fact have a, um, a separate conflict underway right now between Sudan and Ethiopia along their, their borders. Um, it's in the Farsaga area, which is a farming area, uh, in an, an area claimed by Sudan, also claimed by Ethiopia. But in, in the last several decades, it has been Ethiopian farmers who have been farming the area sort of at the, um, uh, at the goodwill of the Sudanese government. Uh, this broke out into a conflict not long after the Tigrayan conflict broke out. And I think uh, probably the Sudan government saw this as an opportunity to take advantage of what was going on in Tigray uh, to put additional pressure on uh, Ethiopia. It sent a lot of troops into the area, basically seized control of the disputed border area and uh, still holds most of that territory. And all of this was happening at the same time that you had uh, discussions going on concerning the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. If you go back more than a year, uh, Sudan actually appeared to be supporting the Ethiopian position on anything to do with the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. That all changed almost overnight, uh, where Sudan has now aligned itself with Egypt on these discussions um, and finds itself um, taking a very different position on the GERD than it did a little over a year ago. And, and again, I suspect probably trying to take advantage of what is going on in Ethiopia and the weakened position that Ethiopia is in today. Uh, the, the GERD negotiations for the moment seem to be stalled. I don't see anything happening on them. Again, it's uh, the African Union is supposed to be taking the lead on that. There may be something happening behind the scenes on it that I'm not aware of, but it, it seems to be pretty quiet at the moment. Um, we have another question, uh, again, in the economic area. How is this affecting uh, foreign direct investment in Ethiopia? Well, I think it's safe to conclude uh, that it's tanking. Um, and I'd be really surprised if, um, if there is much FDI going into Ethiopia at this point in time. Uh, Ethiopia was attracting a fair amount of FDI prior to the conflict. 
And I think the prospects are good for Ethiopia to attract FBI when this conflict is finished, uh, assuming it comes to a, a, a peaceful end. But uh, whenever you have this kind of military engagement going on, you scare off foreign direct investment. I haven't seen statistics uh, on it uh, from either the government of, of uh, Ethiopia or any of the international organizations. And I'm not sure that there have been any statistics released in the last eight months or so. Uh, but I just cannot imagine that any significant FBI, new FBI is going into the country right now. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything even anecdotal on, you know, economically how the country is doing, how the average Ethiopian is doing and whether there have been economic displacements because of, of this conflict? Well, the, the Ethiopians have opened new negotiations for debt resettlement or debt settlement with China. That tells you something. Um, they're clearly having difficulties uh, repaying uh, the debt with China, which is one of the larger uh, holders of Ethiopian debt. Um, I, I haven't looked recently at foreign exchange holdings, so I'm not sure if they have been drawn down. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised that they have, but I don't know that for a fact. That would be an interesting number, and I think it's one that uh, probably a fairly recent number is available on that. I just haven't seen it. Yeah, uh, we have a question. Uh, uh, please comment on the role of the regional militias throughout Ethiopia. Uh, Pre-November, wasn't the Tigray militia very large under the training and the predecessor to the TDF, uh, uh, Tigrayan Defense Forces? Has the Tigrayan Defense Forces slant uh, TPLF been successful in building links to other opposition groups inside Ethiopia? The, the uh... Regional militias are a critical factor in, in Ethiopia today, and in many respects, kind of a worrisome factor because you don't know to what extent they're operating under the authority of higher, of higher authority. Now, we know in the case of, of Tigray, they're not. They're operating on their own, or either that or under the, uh, the uh, guidance of the TPLF, certainly not operating under the guidance of, of the central government. But you have a, a very significant militia in Amhara region, which we know has gone into Western Tigray and has been one of the main forces there. Uh, we don't really know the degree to which they are under the control of the Ethiopian government. And that's a, a very important question. There also are militia in Oromia and Oromo region. Uh, and the degree to which they are under central government authority is also questionable. Uh, there are reports that uh, the, uh, uh, the Tigrayan defense forces have linked up with the um, Oromo Liberation uh, Army, uh, which is one of, the, one of the wings or one of the militias in Oromia. Uh, it's not entirely clear to, to the degree to which they are uh, exchanging information or tactics, but um, they, they seem to be working together. There are other militia in other parts of Ethiopia that are operating with a certain amount of independence. And all of these groups are worrisome because they're armed and they can do pretty much what they want um, unless the central government forces step in to control them. So yes, this is a real concern. Um, I'm going to pair a couple of questions. Um, uh, we have one that says uh, um, the conflict has left so much destruction in the region. Do you think the international community has done enough to mitigate the conflict? And another one from Ambassador Bazora asking, uh, can you please summarize what the U.S. is and is not doing to help resolve the Ethiopia crisis? Why do we not seem to be very actively engaged given the strategic importance of Ethiopia? Well, let me, let me take the last first. Um, I, I would argue that the U.S. is actually doing quite a lot. Um, I, I'm a little surprised we're doing as much as we're doing. The, uh, the U.S. Has, um, has put sanctions front and center with this. 
mainly sanctions against individuals so far, although we have very early on in the conflict, the United States started holding back a certain amount of development assistance uh, going into Ethiopia. Uh, we still are the largest provider of humanitarian assistance to Ethiopia by far. No one is close to the amount of providing the amount of humanitarian aid to Ethiopia that the U.S. is providing today. And my guess is we'll continue to do that because we, we see that the need is so great. Um, the U.S. is uh, certainly pushing very hard as a, uh, as a result of the threat of sanctions to uh, encourage a ceasefire and encourage negotiations. Uh, the U.S., I don't think, has any interest in sending any troops into uh, uh, Ethiopia. I'd be very, very surprised uh, based on other things that are going on around the world and what we're doing in places like Afghanistan, that there's any stomach for sending any troops into, uh, uh, into Ethiopia. Would the U.S. be supportive of a U.N. peacekeeping operation? Perhaps. I haven't heard any discussion of that, but that might be a possibility at some point in the future, although I don't know as though either side is interested at this juncture and having a UN peacekeeping uh, operation in the country. Uh, so the US is doing, I would argue, probably more than any other bilateral government in terms of trying to encourage an, a resolution to the problem. The UN is very active. Uh, the AU needs to get more involved, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but no one else is being as active as the US uh, is in terms of negotiations and uh, using the power of the bully pulpit, et cetera. Um, is that enough? Well, probably not. Um, and it, it's going to take uh, action by others, particularly the Europeans, I think, to underscore the, um, the message the US is trying to send to have an impact on all the parties, including on the, the TPLF. Uh, it would be helpful if countries like China and Russia would do something other than say, well, let's all sit down and, and be nice to each other and drink tea uh, and solve it that way. That is not going to solve the problem. And, and uh, China particularly has a lot of leverage uh, in Ethiopia, but their traditional um, handling of these kinds of issues is not to go along with sanctions. Uh, to declare them as interfering in the internal affairs of another country and to stand by and preach that you need to negotiate a solution, uh, but not do anything about it. So that is not being particularly helpful in my view. Um, now I've spent so much time on the second part of the question, refresh my memory on the first part of the question. Uh, well, the, the first part of the question was on uh, the international uh, community, whether the, there's a role for the international community to, um, or have they done enough to mitigate the conflict? And if not, what should they be doing? Yeah, I, I guess I did partially answer that. Um, no, they're not doing enough. Uh, I suppose you could argue that until the conflict is brought to an end, they're never doing enough. Uh, I mean, until it's solved, you're not doing enough. But there is a, a certain responsibility here by one, the government of Ethiopia, and two, the TPLF. Uh, it's not as though they are uh, lacking responsibility for bringing this to an end. And if they could agree to at least begin a negotiation process uh, secretly if they want, if they don't want to admit that they're talking to each other, fine. Who cares how it's being done? Maybe talks are going on and we just don't know about it because they are in secret. But to the best of my knowledge, they're not. And in the first instance, these are the parties that, um, in addition to the Eritreans, who have certainly not played a helpful role in all of this, and some of the local militias uh, that I talked about earlier, who are also very much engaged in it, all of these parties have got to sit down and, um, and try to sort this out. And it, pressure from the international community will certainly help, but you, you really can't force these parties to deal with it unless you're prepared to send in massive numbers of troops 
uh, and at the barrel of a gun forced him to do it. And, and that isn't going to happen, uh, certainly not by the United States. And I don't think it's going to happen uh, from any other party either. Uh, that does leave the possibility of a UN peacekeeping operation, but uh, I haven't seen much stomach for that in the UN, and I haven't seen any willingness for that from the Ethiopian parties concerned. So I don't see that happening. So the short answer to the question is no, they're not doing enough. Um, but how do, how do you get anyone to do enough when the, the parties in the conflict are at this point not interested in talking to each other? Um, we have uh, another comment with some questions, uh, look, taking more of a historical perspective uh, the, and the comment, the boundaries of most African states were established by the European colonial powers in the 19th century. These often did not follow tribal regional lines, which has provoked conflict in su successor states. Ethiopia is rare as a state which has remained independent except for the Italian occupation. However, its post-war experience has been one of breakup. Eritrea was once part of Ethiopia, and now its region, now its border region of Tigray is trying to break away. How much of this is due to tribal resentment, which becomes national feeling? Is Islamism a factor? Now, that's an interesting question, whether Islamism is a factor. And, and if it is a factor in the, in the Tigray conflict, I have not seen it. Uh, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, keep in mind that, that Tigray has a very, very tiny uh, Islamic population. It's almost um, imperceptible. Now, Ethiopia, on the other hand, has a fairly significant uh, Muslim population. It's probably around 40% uh, of the total population of Ethiopia, but not, not in Tigray. Uh, and Likewise, across the border in, um, in Eritrea, that border area is, uh, for the most part, not Islamic either. There are some small groups uh, along the border that, that are Muslim, uh, particularly where, where you have uh, Afar region uh, adjoining, uh, creating a tripoint area. But I, I don't see that Islamism is, um, is really uh, a significant factor in all of this. Um, it, uh, it is nevertheless an interesting, um, an interesting question. The issue of, of ethnicity is clearly uh, an important part of it and has been from the beginning. You had in Ethiopia prior to the outbreak of conflict and still have today, the whole concept of ethnic federalism uh, that was um, created by the EPRDF in 1991 as the system of governance. And this is a hotly disputed concept. There are those in Ethiopia who like the idea of ethnic federalism. Uh, a lot of the Oromo, for example, will be quite supportive of ethnic federalism. Uh, the Somalis might well be supportive of it. Uh, generally speaking, the Amhara don't like the uh, concept of ethnic federalism. The Tigrayans are uh, like the concept. But it, what it did was, since 1991, was to strengthen the ethnic lines in the country. And that is playing out today. And that is one of the reasons I think that there is uh, considerable uh, sympathy in Tigray for secession of the region from Ethiopia to the point of creating an independent state of Tigray. My own view is that would be a mistake. I, I would not personally like to see that, because I think it would be uh, the beginning of a series of um, defections of geographical territory from Ethiopia to the point that you could have the balkanization uh, ultimately of Ethiopia. In other words, you would have a, a series of small, poor, landlocked states, um, all of which would be questionably uh, or unquestionably um, viable and, and one just doesn't know whether they would be viable or not. You know, a, a state like Oromia is big enough where it could probably exist on its own, but some of the others, I really doubt whether they would be economically viable states. 
Um, we have a couple of questions about the aromos. Um, one of them is, do you think the threat of, oh wait, wrong one, sorry. Uh, what are your concerns, if any, about the Romo Liberation Front joining the TPLF uh, in its agenda to destabilize the country and change the federal government? And another one, I wonder why the Aromo opposition members who are in are, who are behind prison bars for politically motivated reasons are not mentioned or pressured by the Abbey government uh, to release them. Um, I'm, I'm not sure who is supposed to, who is, is supposed to pressure the Abbey government to release the political prisoners, whether that is, uh, is mentioned in the, in the question or not. But uh, it, it is true that there are Oromo political prisoners and the numbers are, are probably fairly significant, um, although I wouldn't want to try to put a number on them. Uh, there's a long history in Ethiopia of Oromo political prisoners. That was a serious problem during the EPRDF phase of government also. Um, I, I'm assuming that human rights organizations are putting pressure uh, on the government to release the political prisoners um, I, I must confess, I haven't really heard pressure coming from the United States or the European countries on this particular point. Maybe they have singled out some of the more um, prominent uh, Oromo leaders to be released from prison. But as a general um, concept, I, I haven't seen any particular identification of this as a major issue. Uh, in the US government or the European governments. Um, and part of the problem may be that a lot is not known in terms of numbers um, and, and other than a few very prominent individuals who, uh, who all is involved in this. Um, as far as the, um, the role of the Oromo Liberation Army, um, and I, there may very well be factions of the, um, the Oromo Liberation Army with not all of them necessarily agreeing with this marriage of convenience with the TPLF or the, the Tigrayan Defense Forces. There's a lot I don't know there, and there's probably a lot most people don't know in terms of what is going on. Uh, nevertheless, that is a, a potentially worrisome development in that it simply adds to instability in Ethiopia, and it implies expansion of the conflict beyond Tigray. Uh, certainly, if you, if you do uh, engage on the ground or if the, o, the uh, OLF forces engage on the ground in part of Oromia, that's going to, by definition, expand the conflict and it's going to make it more difficult to negotiate an end to it. And in theory, you want to, uh, to get negotiations underway before it gets too complicated. And the longer this thing goes on, with those negotiations not underway, the, difficult, the more difficult it's going to be to have successful negotiations in the end. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Sir Harold Hookie Walker. Um, how would you characterize Eritrean motivations? Uh, yes, I, uh, I, I think that, that President Isaiah Sapworthy wants to be basically the leading figure in the Horn of Africa and wants to be seen as um, someone who is superior to the leaders in neighboring Ethiopia, uh, also wants to um, effectively eliminate the TPLF um, that he considers to be an enemy organization. And I think that is why he unleashed Eritrean troops in, uh, in Tigray. And initially, it uh, looked like he was succeeding to some extent. Uh, I'm not sure that this has worked out well for him. And I, I don't know the degree of support that this policy has inside Eritrea, but uh, it would seem to me that um, that was his initial goal to to demonstrate that he really is the senior leader now on the Horn of Africa. He certainly has been around longer than anyone else. He has effectively been the leader 
of Eritrea since it uh, received uh, de facto independence in 1991 and de jure independence in 1993. He's been the only leader of, of Eritrea. No one else in the Horn of Africa can claim longevity like that. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, you hubris, hubris uh, becomes a little heavy in, in the way you, you see things. And I just wonder if that hasn't impacted um, the president of Eritrea at this point. But I think those are his two goals, uh, to be seen as essentially the, the leading figure in the Horn of Africa and to eliminate the, um, the TPLF from, from existence, if he can. Um, another question from Ambassador Cohen. Uh, is it conceivable that an eventual settlement would consist of a true decentralized federal system? Uh, theoretically, I, I think that could be an outcome. Um, as Ambassador Cohen knows better than I, those are very difficult to, um, to reach an agreement on, on something like that. Or it's not so difficult to reach the agreement. It's hard to implement uh, an agreement that is reached. Uh, we're pretty good at, at uh, when I say we, I mean the international community and, and Africans collectively are fairly good at reaching agreements and signing agreements, uh, we're much less good at ensuring their implementation. And I think that might be the problem with, uh, with this kind of an arrangement in Ethiopia. Uh, it, it would be hard even to reach the agreement, but it would be much harder to implement it. But I don't rule it out. And, and one does have to ask, what, what is the ultimate solution to a, a country like Ethiopia? Is it, uh, is it federalism of some kind? Not necessarily ethnic federalism, but some kind of federalism. Uh, is it an, a very autocratic regime ruled top down, like you have in Eritrea, for example? Uh, is it some sort of more democratic system where you try to develop parties based on substantive issue? Uh, which has not worked so far in Ethiopia. There, there have been parties that have uh, tried to develop a following based on substantive issue, but they haven't gotten very far. They haven't developed much of a following. So, you know, I don't know how you do this and, um, and make it work, uh, but any of these uh, outcomes is, I would argue, a possibility in Ethiopia. Um. Uh, another question, given the degree of animosity towards the Tigrayans and the destruction uh, are the, uh, caused on them or the, the damage caused by the federal government and the Amharas, what alternative choice do the Tigrayans have except to get themselves free of the central government? In other words, what, what, are, what options do the Tigrayans have? Well, I, I have no doubt there are many Tigrayans who are making that case uh, that they, they have no other option. Uh, as I indicated earlier, uh, I, would, I would hate to see that happen because I think it would be the beginning of the end of Ethiopia as we know it today. And I think that would be unfortunate. I think that there still is um, the possibility that uh, Ethiopia can come together uh, as, a, as a unified country maybe uh, some significant amount of federalism involved uh, in order to ensure that it stay together. But I think that alternative is preferable to a, the secession of Tigray and an independent Tigray, which I believe would be followed by other uh, geographical entities in, uh, uh, in Ethiopia that would demand their independence too. Uh, but as I, suggest, I think, a lot of Tigrayans who are saying there's no option. And that's why I think it's incumbent upon the central government to, to start talks to find out what is possible from the Tigrayan side in order to prevent just that kind of an outcome. But I don't think the solution is forcibly, uh, militarily, keeping Tigray inside a unified country that the Tigrayans don't want to be part of. That, that strikes me as not being a realistic 
option. Um, so negotiations are the only way out. Uh, we have another question um, wondering whether the threat of sanctions by the U.S. government uh, would be enough to make a difference in forcing the parties to start talking uh, toward, an end, toward ending the conflict. Well, so far they have not been, and, and the, the threat of sanctions has now been around for a couple of weeks. Uh, the, the sanctions that uh, President Biden laid out are mainly focused at individuals, uh, either in the government of Ethiopia or entities associated with it, or the TPLF and entities associated with the TPLF. Uh, and, and that can have a, a significant impact on individuals. It doesn't necessarily have that much impact on the government per se or the TPLF per se. Uh, so I, I doubt that that alone is going to be the deciding factor. That's why I suggested earlier that um, it's important that the European countries, uh, the United Nations, the AU, uh, all collectively get behind some effort to bring the parties to the negotiating table. And it would sure be nice if, um, if countries like China and Russia would be more supportive of this kind of an effort uh, rather than take French leave. Um, and I, I just don't see them doing that at this point in time. Um, but um, no, I don't, I don't think that the current sanction proposals is enough to uh, turn the table on this. Um, thank you, Ambassador Shin. We are almost to the end of our time. So if we could spend the next minute or two, if you have any sort of final wrap-up comments you'd like to make or, or, or any questions that didn't get asked that you think would be relevant to, to address. Well, we've covered a lot of territory and, and obviously, you know, I don't have all the answers and I, uh, I prefaced my remarks by indicating that if you're not on the ground, particularly in Tigray, where there has been so much mis misinformation, it's really easy to make mistakes in interpreting what is happening uh, in the country generally or in Tigray in particular. Uh, I haven't been to Tigray in a number of years and my last visit to Ethiopia was 2019, sort of pre-COVID-19. Uh, so it, it's, really, it's really hard as, to, as an outside observer to try to piece all of this together. I do the best I can with the best information that I have access to. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of bad information out there, and I'm sure I fall into the trap of, of uh, accepting some of it that uh, I probably shouldn't. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I have given you my very frank view of this situation, and I would simply close by saying I, I wish all Ethiopians well. I still have an enormous interest in the country and in the good uh, will of the country and in the future of the country, and ideally a unified country and to stay unified, uh, but I worry a great deal about it now. I've been uh, involved with Ethiopian affairs, either academically or otherwise, going back to the, uh, the mid 19s, the early 1960s actually. And um, it's uh, a country I feel very strongly about, but I worry a lot about it too. And uh, we have an interesting uh, final comment from Ambassador Hank Cohen, who says, let's face it, the Amhara are condemned to rule. Abby wants to be Minalik the ninth if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, so thank you, Ambassador Shin, and thank you, Ambassador Ray, uh, and to our audience for the great questions. I thought it was a, a really interesting conversation. And I'm reminded that it's just about one year ago, it was in November that we had our very first Africa program event. It was on what had the new conflict in uh, Ethiopia and Tigray. And that YouTube video, which gives you some very interesting background and is worth a, a very worthy companion piece to, to our, our, our talk today, which will also be on our uh, FPRI's YouTube page. But I, I would encourage you to also listen to that previous uh, video, again, done in November uh, 2020. It's on our FPRI YouTube site. And it... I believe is the most viewed video of FPR's videos of all time. 
So it's a really excellent conversation, as was this one today. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, thank you, Ambassador Ray. Thank you, Ambassador Shin. And thank you to our supporters and members. And please come join us again and check us out on our webpage, www.fpri.org. Thank you. And Raleigh and Charlie, I thank both of you for having me and I wish you all the best. Thanks for being thank with you. us today. Thank you. All the best. Bye-bye.